Good morning. My name is Robert Lamb. I am the director of the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation at CSIS. Thanks all, um, to all of you for coming this morning. Um, I want to start by thanking Finn Mechanica for making this uh, entire day possible. Um, I'd like to request that you all please silence your cell phones uh, so that we're uh, not interrupted uh, during this what I think will be a lively and interesting discussion on Afghanistan and Pakistan. We will be live tweeting this event um, from uh, at CSIS underscore org. Um, so if you see Tony Cordesman playing with his cell phone, that's because he's tweeting the, uh, the entire event. Um, following the panel, we will take questions from the audience. Um, please wait for the microphone to, to come to you uh, because we are, um, uh, we are live streaming this over the internet and we want to make sure that everybody can hear your question. Um, when you do get the microphone, um, please identify yourself and phrase your question as a question. Uh, please uh, uh, don't, uh, don't give any speeches. Uh, just you know, keep your questions limited. Uh, lunch will be served during the third session beginning at 12.30. This session ends at 12.15. Um, uh, a little bit about our program, the, uh, the, C, the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation, um, known as C3, used to be called the Post-Conflict Reconstruction Project. We're now in our 10th year at CSIS uh, during a time when the field has changed fairly dramatically. Uh, 10 years ago after 9-11, uh, there was a lot of hope about post-conflict reconstruction um, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. We've had uh, quite a lot of experiences with post-conflict reconstruction, and um, we have found that it's time to, to rethink uh, where we are in the field, where we've come. Um, a lot of what we do in our program looks at development and governance in particular in crisis and conflict areas, um, in particular looking at the, uh, the risks, challenges, and opportunities for cooperation that might <coughs> exist. Um, I, I'm thrilled today to be uh, sharing the stage um, uh, with three distinguished panelists, um, Anthony Cordesman, um, to my immediate left here is the Arlie Burke Chair um, in Strategy at CSIS. He's a Defense Department uh, Distinguished Service Medalist. Um, he, he participated in the 2009 Afghanistan Review um, and uh, has done quite a bit of advising um, on the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and obviously in many other places as well. Um, going back many years, uh, his, his uh, service uh, to the field of strategy, uh, goes back all the way to Vietnam. He has, uh, <laughs> he has uh, studied probably every major strategic issue uh, that has arisen, everything from energy to <laughs> nuclear to uh, Middle East. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to his comments today on <laughs> Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Corey Shaki has joined us as well. Um, she's currently at Hoover, um, has formerly taught at West Point, um, Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, and uh, the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, where she and I both got our, uh, our PhDs. Um, during the Bush administration, she was at the Department of State in the Office of Policy Planning, and also at the National Security Council, um, where she uh, advised on defense issues, and um, including interagency coordination and working with our, um, our allies um, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and finally, uh, all the way to my left, we have Ambassador Newman, um, former ambassador to Algeria, Bahrain, and Afghanistan. Um, spent a good deal of time in, uh, in Baghdad um, advising on uh, uh, political affairs and any number of other issues. Um, he was once a deputy assistant secretary in the Bureau of Near, uh, Near East Affairs in the State Department. Uh, is a published author and uh, a very well-known expert um, on all things having to do with the subjects we're talking about today. Um, so uh, thank all of you. Uh, for being here. Um, it's, it's very easy to be pessimistic uh, about the, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, the transition uh, in Afghanistan, and the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. Um, clearly, in both countries, there's problems with, with uh, corruption, problems with relations between uh, civilian and military parts of the government. Um, there is a good deal of violence in both countries, uh, some related to insurgency, uh, some uh, um, more terroristic in nature. Um, strange relationships between government officials and uh, various malign actors, organized criminals, uh, former warlords and commanders. It's a very challenging environment to work in. In Pakistan uh, last year with the death of Osama bin Laden, the relationship with the United States uh, broke down pretty severely. 
And uh, here we are, um, you know, nearly a year later, and we're still struggling to, to redefine that relationship. Um, it's somewhat harder to be optimistic about the situation in both countries. Um, but saying the situation is completely hopeless is, is not particularly helpful uh, to those who are trying to figure out how to move uh, the situation in both countries forward. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, we can observe at least that 10 years ago, the country was essentially a medieval theocracy. Um, and say what you will about the state of the government and the economy, um, both of which are bad, um, they are at least not Taliban era bad. Um, there are a number of former warlords and combatants who are uh, participating in the Afghan political process and not necessarily still as combatants in the civil war as they have been in the past. That's not to say that they might not be again in the future, uh, but there is participation in political processes, formations of political parties. Um, generally speaking, there are, um, uh, there has been progress in the cities probably more than in, the, uh, in many of the rural areas. There are some rights and some stability and some market activity that have not been seen in Afghanistan in a long time. Again, that might not be sustainable. Um, that could collapse fairly quickly, uh, as history has shown us. Uh, but we do need to acknowledge the progress that has been made. And probably most importantly, most Afghans probably do not want the country to collapse into civil war they would probably prefer that their government would work and that their military be strong enough to defend the country and protect them uh, without being a participant in the Civil War. Uh, these are some of, the, uh, some of the observations that we can make that could potentially be built upon for the future. Um, but again, it's, it's all tenuous. In Pakistan, uh, most Pakistanis probably do not want the military to take over uh, the civilian government again. Um, the civilian government is likely to complete its full term for the first time in some decades. The judiciary is, is increasingly independent and self-confident, and civil society is increasingly confident, even in the face of a great deal of uh, intimidation from uh, militants and extremists. Um, there have been some governance reforms that separated powers at the local level and established the requirement for local elections. These are promising. They have not been fully implemented. It's not entirely clear when they will be. Uh, but at the very least, they have put in place uh, some, uh, some incentives and some frameworks uh, for reform in the future. Uh, most importantly in Pakistan, there are a lot of Pakistanis who also want their government to function well and would prefer that um, there not be support to militant groups and terrorists operating within their borders. Now, you can't build strategy on optimism, and you can't build strategy on, pes on pessimism. Uh, you need to, to build strategy on a realistic understanding of uh, the facts on the ground and what is actually possible. Um, in Pakistan, it probably is not useful for us to, to disengage. Uh, the more we disengage with Pakistan, the less influence we'll have in there. And we already have uh, very little influence on uh, Pakistan's uh, domestic politics and quality of governance, for that matter. So the challenge is, how can we marginalize those within uh, the Pakistani government, military, and intelligence services who are uh, anti-American, who, who take more militant views, uh, more hardline views about the use of violence in and outside of Pakistan? How can Pakistan's many moderates and reformers um, and Democrats be supported? Um, what can the United States do uh, to make sure that they're not marginalized within Pakistan? Um, those are open questions. In Afghanistan, there are open questions about governance and political settlement. Uh, it's an extremely difficult situation, uh, as we all know. The government is often seen by many analysts, particularly here in the United States, uh, as being one of the main roadblocks on the path to stability in Afghanistan. Um, it's not necessarily the case that we can depend on the Afghan government to be able to hold the country together, to not be corrupt, to build up a relationship with its own people. Um, Afghanistan is the kind of system that uh, we don't necessarily understand how to analyze, but there is at least an academic term for it. It's called a hybrid political system, which means that there is a formal government that structures the overall uh, systems of uh, decision making and service provision in that country. But the formal government is merely the skeleton to that system. Um, informal actors, uh, tribal and ethnic leaders, uh, organized criminals, insurgents, and various 
other individuals in Afghanistan are the flesh, the muscles, sometimes the tumors on that system. Collectively, they make up a hybrid system in Afghanistan. Um, to the degree we think that we're going to try to get the government of Afghanistan to have a monopoly on governance and violence in Afghanistan, um, I think we're probably fooling ourselves. Uh, that's a long-term project, probably the work of generations. Over the next two years, Afghanistan will probably continue to be, well, Afghanistan will certainly continue to be a hybrid system. And so the question is, to what degree can we shape that hybrid system so that it's stable, so that there's not an increase in violence, so that there's not economic and political collapse in Afghanistan. I've asked our speakers to talk about their views of uh, some of the most important risks that we face in both Afghanistan and Pakistan on what they think are the most important U.S. interests in both countries and what changes they think need to be made in the current approach. So I'm going to step down and um, let, them give your, um, let them give you all their views. And um, I think I'll start with, uh, with Tony Cordesman. And you're welcome to sit or stand as you, uh, as you like. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to talk specifically about the risks in transition. And let me preface this with two points. First, it's by no means clear that if we can't achieve most of our goals, Afghanistan somehow comes back under Taliban control. It may well divide. We need to remember that for all the problems that are within the Taliban and other insurgent movements, they are relatively limited in strength and coverage. They are tied to given belief structures and ethnic groups. What may well happen is that Afghanistan reverts to something very close to what it used to be, a capital with a group of various ethnic and sectarian and geographic groupings. And if that happens, I think it is also important to note that as countries go, particularly in today's financial climate, this is not a country of great strategic importance to the United States. We are not in it because of its strategic importance. We are in it because at a given point in time, it was the center of a movement that conducted successful terrorist attacks on the United States. Whatever happens for all the talk of a new Silk Road, this is not going to be an area of major economic importance to the West, to China, to Russia, to the countries in the region, it may be. There are many other centers of extremism, of Al-Qaeda now, emerging as ones which probably are going to be more serious threats. And in fact, Pakistan is much more the center of Al-Qaeda today than Afghanistan. But let me go back to 2009 and say, where are we on the road to transition and what I think will happen and do it very quickly. We had, I think, unrealistic hopes on the part of some that we could deal with the problems of corruption and effectiveness in the Afghan government. We will not make success. All of the objectives that were formerly on the table are not going to happen by 2014. And this is not a reflection on President Karzai. It is part of a very broad system of competing power brokers, of people struggling for money, struggling for influence, and struggling for security. There will be better ministries. We will have trained more civil servants. But by and large, Afghanistan is not going to meet the goals that were set in the Afghan compact. And the bodies which deal with corruption are almost uniformly ineffective. And when they become ineffective, either end up with scapegoats or end up in being disbanded. Whether that matters or not is a real issue. I suspect that as the money grows weaker and smaller, Corruption will revert to the more affordable patterns. We are not going to deal with the insurgent sanctuaries in Pakistan. It is brutally clear that whatever our hopes were, that Pakistan would turn against these insurgencies, Pakistan will focus on its own internal security issues. We can talk, we can meet, we can get occasional cooperation, 
but the Hekmatyar group, the Haqqani group, and the various forms or groups of the Taliban are not going to be somehow pushed out unless there is some kind of unanticipated peace settlement. The sanctuaries in, Af in Pakistan in 2014 and 2015 will be very much what they are today. That creates a massive challenge to security. Our transition plan for the Afghan National Security Forces is frankly not a plan. Roughly a year ago, we were talking about expenditure levels of seven to nine billion dollars a year through 2020 for the Afghan National Security Forces, a force of over 300,000, of which roughly 40% would be five different police forces. And this is an important distinction because it's often confused with an army. We are now talking about $4.4 billion a year after transition, having cut our FY13 request roughly in half from what we spent in FY12. We're talking about going down to 230,000. None of us really know what this means, and this focus on manpower numbers ignores the fact that when it comes down to transferring responsibility, both within the ministries, according to the Department of Defense reporting, and in the training force, we have not yet been able to put together the structure to provide sustainability, the skilled elements of a force structure as distinguished from battalion elements. Within the police, we have a pattern of corruption, local influence, which is going to be the pattern of corruption and local influence when we leave. We have a peace negotiation. If you go onto the website for the Taliban, you will find that they declare that the peace negotiation is victory, that they have won, and basically we are forced to concede and we are talking to them because they've won. That's not usually the prelude to a smooth compromise and effective transition out of a military position. And I think that one has to remember what happened in Cambodia, where we ended up with the kinder, gentler Pol Pot taking over, or what has happened closer in Nepal. Pushing too hard for peace too quickly creates two problems. One is you may empower the opposition, the insurgents in the process. The other is no one knows what to plan for. If we don't know whether there'll be a negotiation or it will be successful, how do you plan transition at any level? When we talk about U.S. force cuts, it's important to note that we never build up to the U.S. force levels that were called for in the original McChrystal plan, and we have already built down far more than we had originally planned to build down. Similarly, we never had the number of civilians that were called for in the strategy. Whether that's critical or not is not yet clear, but I think that the plans we had at the start of last year for holding on to the south and moving into the east are not tenable with the forces we are going to have left. And the rate of reduction in the course of the period between June and September of this year is going to create major problems. In terms of Afghan presence and structure, as we look at the real power structure, we still have a question, can we have a successful election at the same year we're in transition? If so, who will the leader be? Will it really matter? We often worry about the quality of the election for the Afghan legislature, but nobody can really explain to me what it does aside from consume assets. The constitution that we left basically gives the president power over virtually all of the revenues, and that leaves provinces and districts with a structure that is inherently weak. The last time I looked, we were at about 25% of the goal for Afghan officials in the field that we had planned in 2009. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is hard to measure. Some people would argue that these are enough. 
When you look at the pressure that is coming from outsiders on what happens as we leave, we don't yet know, but we are seeing a step up in Iranian activity, and we certainly do not see a Pakistan which has abandoned its goal of making Afghanistan strategic depth. Whether India has changed its goals is another issue. What is truly striking is the absolute lack of commitment so far on the part of China or Russia, both in aid and any other kind of active presence. The most that Russia has done is support us, rather oddly, in maintaining power projection. In terms of the actual fighting, let me just make a comment about what I have seen. There are two sources of reporting on Afghan security that are unclassified and official. One is a report by the Department of Defense called the 1230 Report. It's a semi-annual report. Another is a report by the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Two years ago, those reports provided data on areas of insurgent influence, areas where the Afghan government was or was not becoming more effective, maps of where aid was being spent, a whole series of indicators. All of them are no longer in the reports. What we see today is a set of measures which bear a striking resemblance to what happened in Vietnam. We don't talk about insurgent influence. We talk about insurgent significant incidents and insurgent-initiated attacks. Now, strangely enough, we pretend to win by those criteria. They don't take on our conventional forces and win. So the numbers become very favorable relative to the peak fighting of 2010. And that's exactly what happened in Vietnam. We almost never lost a tactical clash. And, of course, it almost never mattered, because what did count was influence, the growth of the ability to control or intimidate the population, something we no longer report upon. It's very disturbing to me, as we head into transition, that we do this, that we do not provide meaningful measures on where the fighting is or the progress we're making or the areas of insurgent influence. After 50 odd years of working with the US government, wherever you see a massive drop in transparency, it is not a sign of success. Now let me just close with the economics of transition. If you go back to the Bonn conference, the Afghan government submitted a paper listing a whole group of reforms that's been promising for the last six years. In return for that, it asked for between 10 and $20 billion a year in aid through 2020. It did not describe how that aid would be spent, and the figures were taken almost verbatim from a World Bank study on transition, which is the same study that the U.S. is using to the extent we have a transition plan. There's a little problem. The World Bank estimate of the Afghan economy is approximately half the estimate used by the State Department and by the CIA. And this just illustrates the almost total disconnect in the level of economic data we have. We don't know, basically, where our money goes. We know how much we appropriate. But we have no accounting system to say exactly where the spending goes inside Afghanistan, and we have no formal measures of effectiveness as to what the aid programs are. Please don't misunderstand. I think we have accomplished a great deal with roads, with water, and individual aid projects. But if you look at these numbers as we go into the economics of transition, we have spent, since this war began, 10 times the highest estimate of the Afghan domestic GDP over the same 10-year period. 
As that money goes down, we risk a recession or a depression of major proportions. And we do not have, in any credible form, the most basic data on the Afghan population, the Afghan economy, or exactly what we have been doing with aid money and exactly who it's gone to. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Corey. So uh, I disagree with a couple of Tony's judgments, and I guess that's where I'll start. I'm going to focus my comments on the risks, though, and maybe we can pick up um, mitigating factors in the conversation. The first place I think I differ with Tony's judgment is that it does seem to me that the military piece of what we are doing in Afghanistan is going better than I think it seems uh, to Tony. The, the problem for me is that the military piece of it never has meshed with other elements of a strategy, and those things are essential to us being able to capitalize on the gains that the military is making. We have never had that right in Afghanistan, and now with the clock ticking down to 2014, some of the essential bargains that we made in Afghanistan I think need to be revisited in order for the transition not to simply result in something we're not going to like a whole lot better than we liked the 2001 version of Afghanistan. The first uh, uh, big thing I think we are not doing is investing in rethinking the structure of the electoral system and the distribution of political power in Afghanistan. There's a terrific uh, posting on shadow government by my colleague Paul Miller today that looks at uh, the choices that we made, what, which of them are inherent in the constitutional structure of Afghanistan, which of them are simply political bargains that we made. And one of the things that really strikes me about the governance structures that the United States endorsed both in Iraq and in Afghanistan is the centralized nature of control. And that's so out of character with a country that has all of the sort of vibrant uh, state and local challenges to federal authority that it leads me to believe that the basic reason we do it is because it's easier for us to manage it that way, right? You put somebody in charge, you help them have authority over the country. But that is, as Paul Miller points out, a terrible match for the culture and the politics of Afghanistan. And then essentially what we have done is allowed uh, the Afghan political elite to carry over the, the constitution from when Afghanistan had a king. And Karzai is currently invested in those powers. Re there's not a regional balance to it. There's not a parliamentary balance to it, as Tony very nicely pointed out. Um, it seems to me in the time we have remaining that focusing on the structure of governance, where changes might be made to the structure of governance to provide for a more pluralistic and more representative Afghanistan is someplace we ought to be investing an awful lot of time and attention. Because uh, if President Karzai honors the constitutional pledge that he will not run again in 2014, um, there's a real opportunity for bringing forward a generation of political leadership and putting in place structures and practices that will make Afghanistan a lot better than Afghanistan currently is, and that can begin to reconnect the people of Afghanistan with a government that they have lost faith in. And their loss of faith in their government is a huge impediment to our capacity to carry out our strategy. Um, a, a second uh, risk that I think I see, and here is, this is the second place I think I differ with Tony. It does look to me like Afghanistan actually does have the potential to revert to the 2001 Afghanistan if we don't play the end game right. And in particular, if we apply the end game that the Obama administration applied in Iraq, I think that is just a recipe for an Afghanistan that reinforces the Al Qaeda narrative. Right? This is their big victory. Ten years, we achieved nothing. They're in control of the country. Al Qaeda. Why wouldn't Al Qaeda make that a central node of their worldwide operations? Because it would feed the narrative that we have spent so much time and so much effort trying to pull up by the roots and to substitute 
with a narrative that is about us having a positive vision for the country. Um, because ultimately, this it's certainly a battle for security, but it's also a battle of narratives and who has an idea that, that Afghans will buy into. Uh, another risk I see is that we are about to convince ourselves of several things about America's ability to change and influence the world and whether it's worth it to do it. Uh, but I think feel to me a lot like the end of Vietnam. Right? that it's too hard, that these countries don't actually deserve our help, uh, they're fighting against us as well as they're fighting with us, that our ideas and values are not something that they share, um, and that it's actually too expensive and too hard to try and create positive change. And while I'm actually sympathetic to a lot of the emotion behind that, because it is really hard, and fighting and winning these kinds of wars is uh, confusing and contradictory, and it's hard to tell when you're making progress. And very often, you only know far in retrospect when the, when the victors in the country you are trying to affect tell their story. That said, um, it, it, if we allow ourselves to begin to believe those things, that leads us to Vice President Biden's counterterrorism strategy, right? Where you just kill bad guys wherever you can find bad guys, and you don't try and send girls to school, solve childhood nutrition, improve the quality of governance. And in my judgment, one of the main reasons the United States can perpetuate its, has perpetuated its global power is because most people in the world and most countries in the world actually want us to succeed. Countries and people don't actually work very hard against what we are trying to advance in the world very often. And that's a huge positive element of American strategy. And if we stop being something more than our military might, the likelihood of other people wanting us to succeed and helping us succeed drops dramatically. And that is actually a consequence of not trying to make the world a better place, not caring about whether, you know, 10 years ago there were 10,000 Afghan girls in school, and now there are 10 million. No, excuse me, there are 2.6 million Afghan girls in school. Um, that creates a different Afghanistan in the long run. Um, and, and we're about to convince ourselves that that stuff doesn't matter, we can't do it, um, and they don't want it. And that seems to me um, likely to cause us a whole lot of problems in the coming two decades. Another risk I see uh, in the end game of Afghanistan is that if we adopt this approach, if we decide hearts and minds are unwinnable, and by the way, it's too expensive and too hard to do, um, that it makes it much more difficult to get positive cooperation for other things we want to do. Because after all, if Afghanistan's the place where you know, the first attack on American territory in the last 50 years comes from, and we don't bother to see that one through to a positive finish, to one that secures our actual interests, um, then why would other countries that we are trying to persuade to do what is in our interests have any belief at all that we're going to see it through to where they and we benefit from it? And perhaps the country it is most important to persuade in this regard is Pakistan for reasons Tony alluded to and that I think are self-evident. Um, another risk, I think, that is internal to the American logic on this is that um, whole of government operations is really hard and we're not very good at it. And we're about to convince ourselves that we can't do this. Right? That our military is great at their job, but nobody else is any good at their job. And we need a strategy that where the military gains aren't weighed down by failures in our diplomacy and our development and other things. Again, I'm sympathetic to the critique. Um, American diplomats and American development workers aren't nearly as capable as they could be. Um, but that's not because they are either stupid or ill-meaning. It's because we don't invest in their professionalism in the way we invest in the professionalism of the American military. 
and we need to fix this. It's a structural fix. It's not impossible. In fact, businesses all over the country succeed at this. The military succeeds at this. Um, we can fix this. We just haven't. And we are looking at the consequences of having it, which is that our military success outpaces our capacity to capitalize on it in diplomatic and economic terms. But the solution to that isn't falling back to strategies that don't have constituent elements of diplomatic and, uh, and development and other aspects. It's making ourselves as good at those other things as we make ourselves at the military success. Um, another risk that I think uh, Tony very rightly pointed out is that the Afghan National Security Forces cannot do what we expect them to do. Uh, this seems to me very much an open question. And while I see positive signs, for me, the, the most significant one recently was the, the comparison of the studies that the American military did about green on blue attacks in Afghanistan and the one that the Afghan army did. The American military did what the American military does so wonderfully and endearingly well. It critiqued what we could do better, right? What, what it concluded is that we need to be more sensitive, we need to be more knowledgeable, we need to be more respectful of the Afghans, and I'm sure all of that's true, um, but it is a problem that focuses on us as the solution. The Afghan army also did a study, and what they found is that the majority of green on blue attacks occur, but the perpetrators of them, their families are living in Pakistan. So that tells you something about their commitment to Afghanistan. It tells you something about the potential for hostage taking. It tells you something about the, um, the likelihood of radicalization. Not only did they identify those factors, but they also have moved to require all Afghan soldiers to have their families living in Afghanistan. So they not only identified the problem, they identified solutions and brought them into effect. And that suggests to me that the Afghan National Security Forces are perhaps better than any of us are giving them credit for. Um, that for me is an important sign. That said, to the extent that our military operations still depend so heavily on night raids, I think there's a real question whether Afghans, when they are in the leadership, are gonna be willing to do this in the way that we've done this. I was uh, quite taken aback in, in um, General Allen's testimony a couple of weeks ago that he mentioned that we have conducted 2,200 night raids in the course of the last year. And he also said that 82% uh, of them uh, captured their intended target and that only 1.5% of those raids resulted in civilian casualties. And that's a very admirable statistic. But that means that at least 330 times a year, Afghan civilians are being killed in the conduct of night raids. Right? That's almost, one, that's almost a death a day, or several deaths a day over the course of the year. That, it's understandable to me why that's difficult for them to sustain. It's understandable to me that when it's Afghans conducting these raids, they will have a much more difficult time building political support for that. And so to the extent our strategy continues to depend very heavily on that, it seems to me problematic. Um, two last quick points. First, uh, I think we are at risk of adopting a strategy where we quarantine failed states. And I would want to be a lot more confident in our ability to play defense before I would shift our strategy that way. It does seem to me that even the Abdul Muttalib uh, bomb threat from December of 2009 suggests to me that we want to have a layered defense and we want to be a lot better at the defense piece of it before we start to shift our strategy that way. And lastly, Perhaps the biggest risk of all of the trajectory that we are on in Afghanistan is that we are reinforcing Pakistan's paranoia about us abandoning them, about India taking over in Afghanistan, about our fundamental hostility to their security interests. And we really ought to, in the course of the next 18 months, find a way to deal with that if we want a, an end state in Afghanistan that we're going to feel achieves our security interests. Thank you, Corey. Ambassador Newman. Uh, 
I've learned over time, as many of you may have, that when a speaker says, I have only a few things to say or I'll be brief, you should understand this is a statement of faith and not a fact and settle back in your chair. Nevertheless, I am going to try to be actually on nine minutes. Afghanistan is not going well. You've heard a lot about that. You see a lot about it in the press. It is also an incredibly complicated situation. And the result of that, for analytical purposes, is that it's very convenient for cherry picking. Those who consider everything impossible and one should leave can find ample evidence to support the conclusion. Those who say the strategy is going well will pick a different array of facts. Uh, the battling goes back and forth, and positions get harder but not wiser. And it's very difficult to get out of this because it is so complex that those who study it or visit it as they begin to develop positions can almost invariably find the examples to support the position they take in. Maintaining an open mind in this kind of situation is extraordinarily difficult, frankly. That perhaps makes it useful to think about a few basics, but not, not to the exclusion of all the complexities. To my mind, there are two big categories of risk to us strategically in Afghanistan. One is that a premature departure leads to a civil war. I don't think it leads to a Taliban reconquest, but I do think it leads to a civil war. And in fact, a great many Afghans are talking about a civil war today and thinking about how they would conduct themselves and positioning themselves. They're not planning it. Nobody's going to start a civil war tomorrow while we're there. But the amount of discussion about a civil war when I went, I was back in 2010 and in March and November of 2011, and the amount of talk had increased by March of 2011, and it had become a sort of common wisdom by the end of that year. That civil war would draw in all of the usual suspects, Iran, Pakistan, Russia, India, and it would go on for a very long time. Take, Le take Lebanon as an illustration in point, smaller country, <coughs> poisonous as they were, the external players were less capable overall than those that will play in Afghanistan. And that civil war has the potential to destabilize a very large part of Central Asia. It is also going to draw Pakistan in, I think, because their view will be that they cannot allow the Indians and their Northern Alliance colleagues to encircle them, and therefore they must support those who will prevent that from happening, which includes a certain number of people that we're fighting with. I find it very difficult to believe that Pakistan will be able simultaneously to do better at coping with its own extremism while supporting the close cousins of the extremists in the war in Afghanistan. So that I think the risk in Pakistan gets worse. And then <clears throat> a point that my colleagues mentioned, it's a huge propaganda and moral shot in the arm for, to use a, a simplified term, jihadists. The second superpower defeated, God is on our side, forward to victory. I don't know where that plays out, but if you think that's a risk you can, that's not a risk, then I think you should think twice about it. It is possible that we will fail. I would say the margin for a kind of messy success is quite narrow, and it is narrower now than it was a couple of years ago, and some of that is our undoing. I would like to propose, though, that the debate about this needs to deal with two basic questions. You can decide that the risks that I describe are acceptable risks, then the cost of trying to prevent them is not worth paying. That is a reasonable position. You can also decide that I overstate the risks but then one should have a body of evidence <coughs> to support that view, not a kind of bumper sticker, the dominoes didn't fall in Vietnam, so let's go. Absent 
dealing with those questions, what one has is a rather puerile debate that is a little more like children saying, I'm tired, and daddy saying, you know, we got 50 miles to go. That is understandable. It is human. It is not intellectually enriching. Uh, so there are risks. The chance of success, I think, is quite low. <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons for that. We were asked, or I was asked anyway, to talk a little bit about what it is we can do about it. And that is, of course, where you know, years of diplomatic practice come from. I don't care how gloomy it is. You know, my job is to figure out what it is I can do about it, um, even if that might be hopeless. I don't think it's quite hopeless here. <clears throat> but in considering this, I think we need to consider also where we are in the transition period. For all the gloom and doom, uh, with a great deal of which, by the way, analytically, I agree. I, mean, I agree with a great deal of what uh, Tony had to say about lousy reporting from our, uh, of what's happening. We are only now at the point where we are testing the theory. We have had considerable military success, thanks, Corey, in, in the South where our troops are. But we do not know whether the Afghans can take that over. We know that the, our troops will have to fight some major battles in the East. We know there is a plan for that. And we know that there is a plan to do that with repositioning. But we have not seen the results. I could go on. But what I'm really trying to say is this is a bit like finding you're in the course and you're about to take the midterm and deciding to drop the course before you take the midterm. <laughs> we will, over the course of this next year, take that midterm and have a better basis to judge the transition strategy. I think, given the level of risk that I see, it is important to use that year as best we can and then rejudge whether we really have possibilities here. Question about what it is we can do. Now, there's. There's always a lot we can do, but we vary, you know, we swing rather wildly between very large expectations and deep depression when the world doesn't change instantaneously. And when one looks at what we can do, I would say, I have to say, by the way, this is unlikely, but the most important single thing we can do is to steady down on our intentions. Because every player takes position to some degree on the United States. Those who side with us, those who oppose us, those who are fighting us, those who are simply neutral or looking for their own survival. And the reality is right now, they have no bloody idea what we intend. This is true of President Karzai, who has told me so. It is true of his most fervent critics, who have said that they do not understand what we intend after 2014, but they have to survive. We have a transition policy that is beginning to come into focus. And maybe if we sign a strategic partnership, it will. But the fact remains that at this point, our intentions post-2014 are not very clear. And our messaging is rather mixed. What does this mean to the Pakistanis? You're trying to, we want the Pakistanis to cooperate more with us. Pakistan is looking at a geostrategic situation where it believes we will leave prematurely and the process we have undertaken will collapse, leading to civil war. And that's the strategic field in which they have to make choices. Afghans are thinking the same. They have 30 years of practice with foreigners leaving. What does this do? It creates hedging behavior. You may have to steal more because you're going to have to run. You tighten your ties with your ethnic and tribal colleagues because they're the ones who are going to fight with you if you're not going to run. But if you do that, you don't really give much of a damn about their corruption and their rapacious behavior. You think there may be a civil war. You start looking at whether you've got your colleagues as battalion and brigade commanders and where they're positioned and where they're stationed in the country. And that takes precedence over professionalism because you're going to have to fight with them and survive. So there are a whole series of hedging behaviors. You want to negotiate with the Taliban, but you think you might be leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, This is a way to raise the price, not to produce a rapid negotiation. 
if you think negotiations are a rapid alternative to war, you suggest that your appetite for war is less than your opponents, and you are simply raising the price or raising their propensity to simply wait you out. Now, I'm not against negotiations, but understand their parallel. So, if there is a single thing that is overwhelmingly important to our chances of success, it is to define what we are going to do and put into it. I have very little expectation that's going to happen, by the way, but I was asked to say, what could we do about this? Uh, so, I'm going to leave it at that. There are any number of bits and pieces. I mean, I've been doing Afghanistan for a number of years now. I first went there in 1967. Uh, and I can tell you, there's nobody who actually understands Afghanistan in a comprehensive way. But the virtue of those who continue to work on it for a long time is that we can raise your confusion to a higher level of detail. Thank you very much. <laughs>
They're in the budget submission. They're not going to change. This is not a year where the Congress is suddenly going to spend more money than the President has requested. We've made a massive cutback already in aid. We did it last year. It's going to be cut again. The State Department has not firmly issued the figure in the OCO account. But basically speaking, when we go into Chicago, we will go into Chicago having already decided we are not going to spend anything like the money that was called for in the original transition planning and going to allies for more pledges. We have some very good data on whether allies meet pledges. Uh, they are historical and they're very clear. But those are civil aid programs. The problem is the massive expenditure in Afghanistan has come from military spending, not aid. The total State Department spending on the Afghan war was 6% of the Department of Defense spending over a 10-year period. The State Department percentage is dropping relative to defense, even with the cuts. And this is the last year, fiscal 13, we can have a major impact on transition. As I pointed out earlier, we have already virtually cut the amount of money we plan to spend next year on the Afghan National Security Forces in half in the budget request. The tentative plan that went from seven to nine billion for the Afghan National Security Forces. Remember, that money pours into the Afghan economy. It actually probably puts more money into the economy than the U.S. aid budget by a factor of two to three. We are going to go to 4.4 billion as the future planning figure, and where a year ago we were planning to spend about 80% of that money, we're now talking 25%. Now, going into Chicago and getting more pledges is going to be like the bond conference. And if you look at the World Bank report, which is the only thing we have, there is no U.S. economic transition plan for Afghanistan. The World Bank report talks about the massive impact of what's going to happen with or without Chicago. And you can see that validated in the report from the U.S. Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, and the issues are raised in the Department of Defense report. Some of these facts, as Ron points out, are who picks the facts. We have three reports on this war that matter, and I would suggest that it's about time we start reading them, because we only have one fiscal year to really handle this transition and we've already made most of the decisions. Ambassador Newman, there's, uh, uh, there's one source of uncertainty is the question of numbers um, and commitment to the international community. Another source has to do with governance and politics within Afghanistan, the capabilities of the government and so on. And I'd like your thoughts um, on both of those. Yeah. We are talking past each other just a little bit. Your original question was whether making the playbook clearer would be an advantage. Corey said it would. Tony talked about how dismal the playbook is. Um, and with, with the usual deference that I have for my colleague, Dr. Gorsman, I agree the playbook is, is not real good. And frankly, I think our choice of numbers is really a bit too low for the strategy. Our, our ways and means are not as well in balance as I would like to see them. But that said, the Afghan and regional expectation that we're just going, that there is nothing, is so large that, in fact, e even what we are going to do, if it is understood and publicized, does have value within the political situation which we were talking about, which was your initial, initial starting point, what people expect us to do. The broad expectation is that we're all gone in 2014. So if you start talking about dollar numbers and maintaining an Afghan army, you can have a big argument about whether that army is sufficient. And you can also have an argument about how much of our dollars pours into the Afghan economy. An awful lot of that has gone in, some has, a lot has gone into equipment, and a lot of what has gone into the economy 
has been construction of facilities which we would not have been continuing anyway. But the size of the Army and salaries, that goes in. So I still come out that it is important to have greater clarity about what we are doing, whether or not that policy is totally adequate to the transition. But the second point I would make is it's kind of an operational one, but signing the strategic partnership agreement or bond is going to have a one day, well, bond, uh, Chicago is going to have a one or two day half life. People forget documents very quickly. So if we really want to use the greater clarity that may come out of this, and I think you may see some more pledges on the Afghan army out of Chicago, then you're going to have to treat them as politicians treat their stump speech. You give it over and over again, and you don't expect that you can give it once and wonder six months later why you have no constituents. So even if we get a degree, a degree of clarity, whether adequate or not, there will be an operational question which may look sort of, this isn't a policy issue, but it is a policy issue, because if you do it badly, you lose the, if you, if you don't do it, you lose the effect of your document. On governance, and sorry to take so long to wind up to your question there, we are now in a position where we have enormous suspicion between us and President Karzai and many around him. And some of that suspicion is because we don't like the way they do things. A great deal of that suspicion has also been caused by us, by our complete mishandling of him and by the misperception of our motives. And, you know, I guess I'm harder on our stupidities than theirs. But uh, the fact is we are now dealing in a situation with a great deal of distrust. And we have a situation where we don't have clarity about whether we will stay. This means our leverage for domestic and governance change is very low. I wish it were better, but it's not. So when we think about what we can do, I wouldn't be too grandiose. I think our ability to restructure the basic form of the Afghan government is almost nil. There are too many. You do that once before you hand over sovereignty. Once you've handed it over, you don't have the ability to make that size change anymore, even if you screwed it up the first time. Um, there are issues. Could one, should one bring the elections forward to late 2013 or early 2014 while we'll have more security in country? If you did that, that's a very big political deal with the parliament. Can we push more in? to the provinces, there's an argument for doing it. Those things are worth looking at, but I think one has to recognize that the amount of influence we have is for marginal change in governance over the next year or two. I'd like to take three questions from the audience. Uh, when I call on you, please wait for the microphone to arrive um, and uh, identify yourself, and please keep your question very brief. We don't have very much time left, and we'd like to uh, maximize the amount of time for, uh, for discussion. Uh, start with this gentleman here. The microphone is on the way. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. I have two brief questions. Before Corey drew some of my fire, I, was, I found it instructive that nobody had mentioned NATO. Uh, so my first question is, what do you think the impact of Afghanistan is going to be on NATO, given that European publics are even more disposed against the war than a majority of Americans? And second about Pakistan, uh, what do we do? Uh, I think one of the many nuts of the problem is that going back to Pervez Musharraf when he was both chief of staff and president, and extending today to Asif Sadari and Pervez uh, Kiani, the Pakistanis have always disagreed with our strategy in Afghanistan. They have argued from the very beginning consistently it was not going to work, so why should they support a strategy that they think was going to fail? And that's been their view collectively for the last five or six years. What do we do to turn that around? Or is there really nothing we can do, and no matter what we think, Pakistan is just going to get worse until it gets better? Thank you very much. Uh, question two um, is at the table. Thank you. My name is Debbie Smith. I run an NGO, uh, PATHS, and we're building a school for kids with disabilities in Afghanistan and Kabul. My question is for Corey. Um, in regards to your comments on uh, the increase of boots on the ground vis-a-vis -vis State Department um, assets, 
I, it's been my observation uh, watching things you in Afghanistan. Keep the question very brief, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, that we have approached it for more of a top down as far as development instead of bottom up. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to that. Okay, and the final question back by the, the back door, please. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to thank you for your comment about how the military does everything right and all the rest of the government is, does everything horribly. Please, please identify that. yourself, sir. <laughs> uh, no, just joking. Um, I, my question is, um, how can we engage uh, militarily, uh, or is it even possible to engage militarily uh, in a cooperative manner when diplomatic channels tend to close up or tensions uh, tend to increase? Uh, is that even possible? Uh, should our military leaders actually continue to push engagements despite uh, military or uh, diplomatic uh, tensions, or is it just inevitable for the military engagements to suffer when diplomatic uh, engagements suffer? Hey, okay, thanks very much. Why don't we begin with uh, with Corey? Okay, I'll take them in reverse order. Um, first, I. I think the and example we have three of minutes each. I'm sorry. Chinese military to military relations with the United States are a great illustration of the fact that when the political relationship is difficult, actually the quiet, low-key cooperation we have in military channels is actually quite advantageous and even more important. I myself am quite critical of the extent to which we are reliant on senior military people to perform fundamentally diplomatic functions. My favorite example is sending the chief of staff of the army to Iraq to talk to the Iraqi political leaders about that stalemate, that sends a terrible signal about American diplomacy, that we are over-reliant on combat boots rather than wingtips, or, or at least good black shoes, um, <laughs> for what needs to be done diplomatically, which takes me to your point. I think you're exactly right. I, it seems to me that we are, are not thinking clearly or strategically about how to do development assistance well. And it's shocking given that we live in a country with the most tumultuous productive economy in the world, that we focus on top-down things in part because um, they're easy. Also because gloriously we have the experience of NGOs and religious organizations and you know the big beautiful mess of American civil society has in the last 15 years moved into development assistance in an enormous way, and it's been great for the world. But we haven't rethought the question of what do we need to do as a government in development assistance? Should we, actually Ambassador Newman has talked quite thoughtfully about this subject, and you might want to talk to him afterwards, but there's a lot that we ought to be rethinking about what does the government need to do at a time when remittances and civil society and private philanthropy is doing so much in this space? And Harlan, to your in, point. In uh, 20 seconds. OK. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I won't talk to the NATO piece, but the Pakistani piece. The Pakistanis do not have a positive strategy themselves for either their own success or success of what they want to achieve in Afghanistan. Working with them in a cr constructive way to nudge them towards things that the Afghans might actually want, that the Pakistanis also want, and finding a basis for cooperation with India is an extraordinarily difficult intellectual and diplomatic task, but it's the fundamental one. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony. Well, very quickly, Harlan, I think in the case of NATO, and this is a thing we all need to remember, NATO countries have populations which have already discounted Afghanistan as a good part of America has. We've forgotten about what happened in Vietnam, but while there are real risks, what minimized the risks was that people already saw it as a war that didn't matter when we left. And that greatly reduced the impact it had internationally. The real problem, I think, in NATO now is whether NATO Europe is going to actually ever implement any of the current strategy in terms of its more limited power projection capabilities and what coherent structure will exist there. The Afghan war is not the test of NATO. Europe is. In the case of Pakistan, I think we need to be realistic. Without getting into it, I think that the agency study of Pakistan probably is realistic. 
Pakistan today is what Pakistan will be in 2014. It is not quite a failed state, but it is a failed government. And its attitudes on the Afghan war are not ones we can change through negotiation. It will be a major problem, and the sanctuaries will remain. In terms of the whole problem of top-down engagement and the rest, the fact is, I think when we talk about military diplomacy and civil diplomacy, what I see in the US and Pakistani teams are actually very good mixes of civil and military diplomacy. But whatever you do in negotiation, you can't do more than the people you negotiate with will allow you to do. And the problem isn't that they had the wrong strategies or the wrong methods of negotiation. We will do a little better with Pakistan because of military to military and civil dialogue, but not much. And finally, on the whole aid issue, understand that our PRT structure already during 2013 will implode down to five entities undefined, but no more than five. The allied PRTs will probably go at least as quickly. That means that sometime by the end of 2013, the number of operational aid workers in the field for governments will be somewhere like a third of what they are now. And the whole surge will have disappeared. How much money they'll have is anybody's guess. That's going to put more and more of a burden on the NGOs if the NGOs can stay. But the thing that's being forgotten here is that the contract security forces that many people depended on will be gone. And the replacement for the contract security forces are one of the undebated failures of the development of Afghan security forces. The system isn't working and it isn't going to work in the foreseeable future. Thank you, Dr. Curtisman. Ambassador uh, Newman, I'm final gonna, word, please. I'm going to take your challenge for three minutes. Um, <laughs> on the, well, I think we need both top down and bottom up. Recognize two things. Bottom up, as vital as it is, is very, very difficult to scale up quickly. It, that the success of most small projects is that they are done carefully at a small level. By their very definition, you can't massively expand them. And we are an impatient folk usually asking for very fast results. That pushes us to both top down, and it pushes us to de often demand speed and metrics that are highly unrealistic, and then to blame the project implementation when that fails. Uh, I don't think I know enough about NATO to say something useful on that. Uh, I can speculate, but it's not worth having. On, on Pakistan, one cannot possibly answer that question in the two minutes and five seconds I have left. But I would say that we, first of all, if we had greater clarity about what we were going to do, we would have somewhat more chance of influencing the strategic perceptions of Pakistan. Without that clarity, we give up the greatest single lever we would have to change their understanding of the world they have to live in and deal with. Secondly, we alternate between um, we want a strategic relationship and we're mad. Um, <laughs> mad as in angry, not as in our other potentials. <laughs> um, that alternation is confusing and it serves little purpose. And one needs to understand that both elements of pressure and of reward are going to have to operate rather continuously. I don't think we do that. On this last question, which is a very complex one about military engagement as civilians, when it's a, if you're talking about negotiations, then I think the answer is these are parallel tracks. You do both simultaneously. Uh, Prime Minister Rabin, I'm very fond of quoting on this one, asked how he could negotiate with terrorists, said that I must fight terrorism as though there were no negotiations, and I must negotiate as though there were no there was no terrorism. And that, I think, is fundamental. When you get down to an operational level, there are times when you need, frankly, to control 
you are military targeting for political purposes. There are other times when you don't. If you're going to run, there are times when you need to do it even within the military. If you're going to run special ops, you need to deal with the local situation and not stumble across your own maneuver units and what they're trying to do. That can also be true of Pakistan. So that were very, very antithetical to the idea of, of political control of military targeting, but there are times when it's appropriate. We may never get past President Johnson misusing it. Um, but there it is. So you can do both, but you need to be looking very carefully what you're trying to do. And I'm 10 seconds over. Thank you. <laughs> well, Ambassador Newvin, Dr. Shockey, Dr. Korsman, and all of you, thank you for coming today.